Welcome to our webinar entitled Characterizing Functional Domains of Potential Therapeutics with Better Protein Purification, presented by BioCompare and sponsored by BioRad. My name is Peter Fung. I'm the Managing Editor of BioCompare, and I'll be your moderator for today's presentations. Now, before we begin, I'd like to inform our viewers that this event will hold a live question and answer session at the end of the presentation. You can submit a question at any time using the Q&A box located on your screen. Also note the resource list containing downloadable documents pertaining to this webinar. Now allow me to introduce our first presenter. Dr. John Bruning is a lab head and lecturer in the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Adelaide. He obtained his PhD in 2005 from Rice University and has been employed in positions that have largely focused on structural biology and biochemical research. John carried out two postdocs. The first was at the Scripps Research Institute and the second at Texas A&M. Dr. Bruning has created and managed the first macromolecular pipeline at the University of Adelaide North Terrace, which includes his own laboratory space as well as access to the general school facilities required for his research. John has recently been nominated to become an adjunct professor at the Scripps Research Institute and is a member of the Institute for Photonics and Advanced Sensing at the University of Adelaide. Today, he'll discuss some tips and guidance for performing protein purification, as well as share a couple of case studies. Welcome, Dr. Bruning. Thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you for inviting me to come speak. Uh, just a bit of background on myself. I'm an X-ray crystallographer, so uh, given that, we have to purify large amounts of protein, and we have to uh, make it very pure for our purposes. So. The, the purpose of my presentation today is just to give um, some tips and overviews on, on techniques for getting really pure protein and, and quite a bit of it. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily matter what you're trying to purify. This could, most of this stuff could be applied to uh, any type of protein. And so I'll just give my uh, tips and what I've learned over the years. So one important thing to consider there's a, there's a few things you should think about before you even get into the lab, before you even start a protein purification. Um, and one of them is a primary sequence analysis. You've got to know your molecular weight and so that when you run your SDS gels, you know uh, where you should be seeing bands. Uh, sometimes you get proteolysis um, or, or not something unexpected, so it's good to know um, exactly what weight you should be looking for. Um, you've got to know the PI because a lot of these techniques will require the charge of your protein in order to knowing what the charge is. So if you don't know the PI, you don't know what your charge is going to be and you don't know what columns you can use. Um, the extinction coefficient, um, you've got to know the extinction coefficient so that you can quantitate how much protein you've got. Um, and so a great you don't have to use this technique, but uh, Expassi, it's free. There's a, a website here that you can use to get uh, anything you could possibly know about the, the primary sequence of your protein. Um, I, and my whole lab does this, and I think it's a great tool. There are others out there. Um, are there any published purification protocols? So this, this is obviously the place to start. If your protein's been purified before, uh, there's, no, there's no sense reinventing the wheel. So have a good look through the literature. And even even similar proteins, like if you've if you've got a dehydrogenase from E. coli, are there uh, is there a dehydrogenase from MTB that's been purified? They're likely to be purified fairly similarly. Uh, and sequence your clone. Uh, usually, when people make their own clones, they they get a sequence, but they they have a tendency to trust other laboratories, and this can lead to trouble. So before you even start your your purification, I would I would make sure that. No matter where your clone came from, get it sequenced. Don't trust anybody because it, it could cost you a lot of time and money if it's wrong. And secondary structure prediction. We'll talk about this a little bit more at the end, but it's good to know uh, if your protein has large regions of um, unstructured pieces that might be amenable you know, to proteolysis or would cause the, the protein to be disordered or, or more difficult to purify. So. Before we get, we kind of break up our protein purification into two stages. We test things on a small scale, and then 
we once we've got conditions we've worked out well, we move up to a larger scale. Uh, and so what are we testing on the small scale? Um, we're testing for solubility and expression, just and the output is an SDS gel. Um, so generally what we do is we just grow 10 mils of E. coli, uh, you know, with our plasmin in it. Uh, we'll talk about alternative expression systems of, briefly at the end. Um, and we induce with IPDG, um, just a standard concentration, and we usually induce overnight at 16 degrees. So the lower temperature generally helps. If you've got, if you've got time and resources, you could do some at 37 degrees. Um, and then we, we grow up several of these, maybe a dozen or 20 of these 10 mil cultures. And so that way we can resuspend each pellet in a different uh, buffer so that we can test things, uh, test which ones uh, give better solubility for the protein. So this would include buffers of different pH. You generally want to be at least one unit away from your PI. Uh, different salt concentrations, even up to one molar for some of the RNA or DNA binding proteins. A standard kind of salt concentration for us is half a molar. It's a bit high, but it, it gets everything washed away in that first step. Uh, so additives, uh, glycerol is a pretty standard one. Non-harsh detergents, tween, et cetera. Um, it's look, good to look, so does your protein bind ATP? It could be good to have some of that in the breaking buffer. Does your protein bind calcium, for example? It's good to, uh, to know what your protein does because some of these ligands can help with the solubility. Uh, and you might be getting them with your protein even if you choose not to. Uh, that, that's another important factor. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that if you have an RNA or DNA binding protein, a lot of times the RNA or DNA will be difficult to separate from your protein, and you won't necessarily see it on an SDS page, or you won't. Um, so that, that's another. Well, we'll talk about how to how to how to QC that later. Uh, so then we you know we break these cells um, using um, little beads, glass beads called uh, bead beaters, and then we uh, centrifuge them and take the soluble bit and put it on SDS page. And the bigger the band, the more soluble. And then we take those winners and move up to a large scale induction. Um, so just some things with the large scale preparations. We, we usually start with E. coli. Like I said, there's other, there's other systems, and we'll talk about that at the end, but um, E. coli is cheap, usually works, not always. Um, we do all of our preps at four degrees. So after we've grown the cells and we're purifying our protein, we always keep it at four degrees C because this will prevent uh, proteases from working as well and keeps the protein more stable. Usually, uh, there are exceptions. Some pro there's some thermophiles that don't like four degrees, but for the as, as a rule of thumb, four degrees is the way to go. Uh, FBLC, I can't stress this enough. This is you can do gradients. You can see where your protein is all the time. Uh, you've got a great way of having it. Uh, it's essentially your own notebook, right? So if you're doing things with the gravity column, it's it's much more difficult to have um, good notes on what what you've done. So I use the BioRad NGC. There's other ones out there. I'm happy with the BioRad uh, cell disruption. Uh, so once you've grown your cells, you got to break them open. Um, we've had a, usually sonication is okay, but we've had several cases where sonication was not okay. Uh, and it led to precipitation of our protein. Um, so we always use pressure. Uh, a French press is the typical way. There are other um, newer ones now, uh, cell disruptors. We have a, one of the newer newer ones. And so we give, uh, I would recommend after you break your cells, give them a really good spin. Um, and, you know, about an, maybe an hour and uh, even use an ultra centrifuge because this is actually a purification step because you're, you're, you're spinning stuff down into the pellet, and the more stuff you can, the more junk you can get away from your protein in that first centrifugation step, the, it's the less stuff you have to purify on the, on later. Um, and typically we grow two to 20 liters, depending on how well our protein expresses. And, you know, this is, this is to your needs, of course. Crystallographers generally need a lot more protein than other, other techniques, so you, you just gotta have to uh, scale up to, to needs, but the more I can say another tip is the more protein you have, uh, the the better the, the purification goes. Generally speaking, uh, use fresh reducing agents. So uh, reducing agents such as DTT and 
uh, beta mercaptoethanol go bad quickly. So I, I, I don't know which one, but anecdotally, about three days at room temperatures, about how long they last. Um, you know, of course, at four degrees, they last longer, but um, why take the risk? Just uh, if you need a reducing agent, if you've got cysteines in your protein, you probably need a reducing agent. Uh, you'll, you'll want to keep that fresh and each step along the way as you dialyze or, you know, your first buffer. Okie dokie. So, uh, strategy. So, I, when I first started protein purification in the late, late 90s, I, I read a tip or was given a tip by someone and I, it, I found it to be invaluable. I don't have the original reference, but the, the strategy basically was try as many different chromatography types as possible. Um, so, for example, don't, don't use five different ion exchange steps. Um, so, what could this include? Uh, a tag? A tag is great. Usually, if you're using some sort of tag, like a his tag, you'll get your protein purified 90% in the first step. So, some common tags are maltose binding protein, GST, uh, NUS. And if you need to, you can remove tag with TEB protease. And I'll talk a bit about that with a real example um, pretty soon. Uh, ion exchange, so this can be cation exchange or anion exchange, and there's there's all kinds of different types out there. Um, generally, we use an enriched Q, which is one of the higher end ones, because generally in my lab, we'll, we'll start with a his tag and then uh, polish up with ion exchange. And so we use one of the more, more expensive ones since we're usually going into ion exchange pretty purified already. Uh, hydrophobicity. Um, so there's, uh, we use a phenyl column. For, uh, to do hydrophobic columns. Uh, size exclusion, this is a great step, especially for, for the last, the last um, step of a purification. So this, this separates things by size. And so a lot of times, if you're doing SDS page to, to see what's on your, on your gel, you won't see aggregation. You know, cause it, it, because it's denaturing, it will all appear great, but it's possible that you have some small amount or a large amount that's denatured. Uh, and so a sizing column can also not only purify, but make a good QC step to see that it's uh, coming out the right, right um, oligomerization state. Um, so there's some columns that are specific to ligands. For example, there's a, a blue column that uh, it, it, it is literally blue, and it, it, it mimics uh, ATP. So this is great for ATP binding proteins, right? So there, there's quite a few of those those type of columns out there. So you've got to know what what's uh, special about your protein. Uh, so, you know, so you can see that these are all quite different chemistry, right? A tag, a his tag, you know, ion exchange, hydrophobicity. And the more of these different types of chemistry you can use, that's uh, the better. So just some other, other tips. Uh, act quickly. You don't want a protein prep to go on for a month. Uh, break the cells and move fast. Don't, don't uh, drag it out too long. Uh, only remove the tag if you need to. Um, some, uh, there's several cases where his tags don't interfere with crystallization, several cases where they do. Um, uh, the thing is, if you have to remove the tag with a protease, it will add an extra, you know, an extra day, at least, to your, your preparation. And you, it, it's always difficult to completely remove the tag. There's always some small amount that, that, that's left, and that, that leaves heterogeneity in your sample that you've got to deal with. Um, typically, after each column step, at the end of the day, we'll, we'll do dialysis. Uh, however, if you have a desalting column, you can, you can exchange your buffer a lot quicker, you know, 30 minutes versus overnight. Uh, however, everybody has to sleep at some point, so dialysis is very convenient for that. <clears throat> uh, and uh, uh, as I mentioned before, I like to end a prep with a sizing column. You don't have to, but it's a, it's a nice uh, QC step at the end, for, and it's especially good for crystallography. Uh, keep your protein on ice, four degrees, usually pretty important. There are exceptions, but um, there are way more proteins that are stable at four degrees than unstable. Uh, use the molecular weight. If you're doing dialysis, use a molecular weight cutoff uh, close to your protein size. Not, not too close, but um, for example, let's say your protein is uh, 50,000 molecular weight. Uh, don't use a dialysis cutoff tube of 500. Uh, use something more like 40,000. And that can actually be a purification step because some of those smaller proteins can, can get dialyzed away. 
Of course, you don't want to be too close because the molecular weight cutoffs are not uh, set in stone, and if you're too close, your protein can sometimes sneak through the dialysis tubing. So you want to be, you know, uh, several thousand away at least. So how do we, once we've got a, you know, it's good to monitor the quality uh, along the way as you go because you don't, you don't need to over purify, but you want to make sure that what you're doing is working. So we run an SDS page at every step along the way. You have to know where your protein is. The chromatograms are great, but they don't tell you exactly where your protein is. Um, we use an extinction coefficient to monitor the concentration. So we know our yield and how much we've got each step of the way. Uh, we use the absorbance at 280 and 260 and calculate a ratio. So this is very important to show that, so proteins generally uh, have an absorbance peak at 280, whereas nucleic acids have an absorbance peak at 260. So if you calculate this ratio, uh, you can see that how, purify, how pure your protein is relative to nucleic acid. Um, so, you know, if this ratio would be higher on the 280 side, if it's protein, you know, closer to 1.5 is good. Uh, and if you've got a lot of nucleic acid contamination, this will be one or under. And so, again, you won't see the nucleic acid on your gel, so it's good to, to do these ratios if you've got a DNA binding protein, even, even if you don't. A lot of the uh, common specs these days, like the NanoDrop, will calculate this for you all the time, and it's there. It's good to have a look just to make sure. Uh, silver stains or Western blots can be uh, a little bit more sensitive than uh, SDS page if you really want to get into it. And silver stains, you can see nucleic acid. Um, monitor aggregation. So, you know, we could do this with the sizing column, as I mentioned before, or you can use light scattering or native gel just to see if your protein is oligomerizing in the, in the correct way. Uh, and check your chromatograms. If the chromatogram is a nice, sharp peak, it will indicative that you've got pure protein. If, if you've got large shoulders of some type, it could be indicative that there's something um, different about your protein on the shoulder or another protein is piggybacking with your protein in the same peak. So let's have a, uh, a look at a real example from my lab. So uh, I work on Aspergillus fumigatus. It's a pathogen, it's a fungal pathogen. And so we're looking for new targets to for drug drug targets and to crystallize them and solve the structure so we've cloned it in in with a tag for solubility um, so uh, in this case we used a gateway ta uh, gateway clone um, the gateway and uh, the lic cloning i think is great um, because you can you can try a lot of different tags very quickly and uh, you know it's, it's a bit more for sure it's a, a more guaranteed output than the uh, traditional cut and paste. So our, our clone had uh, ampicillin resistance. And I'll, the next slide is a bit just more clear. But th this is just to show the cloning and what kind of tag we're using. I will say, though, that if, um, we sometimes have trouble getting MBP away from our protein uh, and not sticking to the once we've cleaved the, the tag away. So we've, we've kind of shift, shifted from MVP to other, other tags like NUS. And so NUS is a fairly large protein. It's 50-something. Uh, um, so here, here's kind of, we can look at in the center of the slide, there's a, a, um, a representation of what the protein is that actually gets produced. So we have a, uh, a 6 his tag a NUS protein, a TEV recognition site for removal of the, uh, the tag, and then our protein of interest here, which is called ERG10 in green. And so up in the top left, we've, we've broken the cells, and our protein is just swimming around with quite a bunch of others. Um, and then you can see it's, it's trapped by the HIS column using nickel. And then uh, on the bottom side here, you can see after the first column step, we've got the fusion protein. So I'll call this protein here the fusion protein because it's got the NUS and our protein of interest uh, eluded. So what do we do after we've got it eluded? We, we do have an SES page. I'll show you that uh, in a bit. So here's the chromatogram. Here's what a chromatogram looks like. And in blue here is the 280. So this, this is the absorbance at, at 280. So this is where you can see your protein coming through. And, or, or any protein, 
And in with the red dotted lines, I've shown where our protein came up. So on the on the left side of this chart, uh, there's the flow through from all the E. coli. So the absorbance, of course, is quite high. And then on the right side, there's the elution and a large peak where our protein came through. And so generally speaking, after the first his column step, our proteins are 90% pure. Of course, this is a fusion protein, so the next step would be to, to cut away the fusion part. Now we've got the fusion protein purified. And shown here, we've got TEV protease. And um, cleverly, our TEV protease has a his tag too for removal of the TEV protease later, because whatever protein you add to your sample, uh, you're making it less pure by adding TEV, right? So you'd like to get that away. So as shown here, we'll cut uh, the protein away. Our protein ranges are 10 away from the fusion protein using TEV. We commonly do this in the dialysis tubing overnight. So TEV will work at four degrees uh, and just in, in the dialysis tubing so that we can buffer exchange overnight while we sleep and have our protein cut away. Um, so after the the um, having it cut away, we put it on a his column again to remove the NUS and to remove the TEV protease. And I'll show you a gel of all of this. So then after the next day, after all of this is cut, we put it over the his column again. And the TEV, as shown in the bottom right here, the TEV will stick to the his column because it has a his tag. The NUS will stick to the his column. And our protein, ERG10, the desired protein, will be in the flow through. So a very quick way to separate the fusion, the cut fusion uh, protein, uh, the NUS, from our, our protein of interest. Uh, this is a very common uh, route to purification. And so here's the chromatogram for the second His column. So in the flow through at the very beginning, on the left side of the chromatogram, you can see the 280 comes up. And so that's where our protein of interest, ERG, came through. And then on the right side, uh, the TEV and the NUS stuck to the His column. So this very easily separated the two proteins. So let's have a look at the gel. And as I said, we, we take a, um, a, a snapshot each step of the way. So on the very left are the E. coli cells before we induced any activity at all. So you can see that there's no ERG there. That's kind of the negative control. So then in lane, uh, lane two is blank. Lane three has our E. coli cells after we induced, and you can see a giant band up there around 100 of our fusion protein, um, showing that the E. coli cells did indeed produce the protein. This can be important because it's nice to go through the uh, purification knowing that uh, your E. coli actually made the protein, right? Because uh, you can go through a lot of the His column and everything and waste a lot of time for um, Sometimes there's problems with expression. It's good to know that going in so you don't waste uh, time through the prep. Um, so lane four is the flow through. So it looks like we had a lot of protein, perhaps so much protein that it saturated the column and some of our protein flowed through the column. Um, so that usually happens if you've got more. Pro so it's good to calculate the, the binding capacity of your column. Typically our his columns have about a 200 mg um, capacity. So what happened here is that we produced more than 200 milligrams of this protein. Um, and so then uh, lane seven, you can see that after we cut the protein, there indeed is a, a band for NUS just in the 50s there. And then there's also a band for our protein just above 40. And so then in lane eight, you can see this after the, the flow through the second His column, our protein flowed through. So you can see that our protein after the two his columns is very pure. There's a few contaminants uh, up up above and that required a little bit more purification. And I should note that here, this might be good enough for most people. Most people could stop here. But for crystallography, we really like to get those other contaminants away. So what, what do we do next? The next column, we use the enriched Q column. I could have deleted this slide, but uh, there's a technical error on our part. And the... Uh, the protein, so this is an anion exchange column, and so you can see on the right side of the graph, the, the salt concentration has slowly increased to bump off your protein. 
um, and purify it from other proteins. So every protein will come off at a different salt concentration. That's that's the the idea with this. And so our protein came off before uh, we even started the the purification, the, the salt gradient, implying that we hadn't dialyzed well enough. Um, I could have omitted this to make myself look better, but uh, this is a real prep. I wanted to show that these things do happen. So we dialyzed again and put it back over the column uh, to get rid of the salt and make sure that it stuck to the column this time. And so I've shown just a snippet of the gradient. I haven't shown the whole thing. So the black line kind of in the middle of the graph is slowly increasing. So that indicates that the salt is slowly increasing. And we've got a nice peak here in blue where our protein came out, and I've highlighted that with the red dashes. And so we've uh, run this on a gel. And so uh, on the gel, let's look at, so this is the, the QC, the final product. So lanes two and three, um, and lanes 11 and 12, you can see there's quite a bit of protein, and it's very pure. There's no other bands there. So um, essentially in three, um, in three, Three column steps, we got a lot of protein and we got it very pure. It doesn't always go this smoothly. Uh, you know, if this hadn't worked, I would recommend a sizing column next, a preparative sizing column, uh, or maybe a hydrophobic column. And so we got, you know, uh, I didn't put the, the yield here, but we we definitely got, you know, dozens of milligrams, and uh, we concentrated it to about eight mg per mil. We generally are concentrating our proteins with the spin concentrators, and uh, it doesn't work for all of them. And that, that's also another step. Uh, when you concentrate, you got to be very careful. Some proteins just cannot be concentrated, and they'll crash out of solution. Um, so that brings me to what, what do you do when things go wrong? Usually things go wrong at the expression and solubility level. So if you do that first analytical step, it, it really takes away most of the, the issues. Um, so things go wrong, you, you find your protein crashing out of solution or you're losing it along the way out of solubility tag. I, I put some examples at the beginning there. Uh, our, one of our favorites now is NUS. MBP would be a second favorite. Uh, analyze the secondary structure for disordered regions. If you've got huge regions that just have no secondary structure whatsoever, you consider getting rid of them, um, especially if they're at the N or C terminus, or, or just do uh, a domain of your protein that has the, the, the bit that you're interested in. Uh, there is high throughput cloning, so if you've got a really important protein that you think will be a, a nature paper if you get a purified or crystallized, um, uh, some of these structural genomics places can, can you know, make 90 or you know, hundreds of different clones in a high throughput matter and test them all for solubility. Uh, I'd have, you know, Oxford and uh, some of the ones in the U.S. Uh, both have, you know, pub published protocols for this kind of stuff, or, or they'll collaborate with you. Uh, depends how much, you know, work you want to put in all of this. Uh, additives, so examples, uh, you know, glycerol, um, detergents, those could really help. Uh, my philosophy is add as few things to your protein prep as needed. However, the, I would accentuate as needed. Most proteins will need salt. Most proteins will need a buffer. Most proteins will need a, um, a reducing agent. So if you could purify your protein in water, do that. Uh, it's unlikely to work, but that would be great. Uh, codon optimization. So if you're using a human protein uh, and you're trying to express it in E. coli, sometimes it just isn't folded correctly. And... Um, Another thing is that the codons are different in E. coli. So you can have your gene synthesized and codon optimized, or you can use an E. coli strain that has the, um, the rare codon ability in it. Like Rosetta is an example. So it has all the tRNA uh, for the E. coli codons, or for the human ones. Um, there are alternative expression systems. So if E. coli fails, um, here are some that are people are using now, yeast. The picky, I think, is the flavor of choice. It used to be cerevisiae. Um, baculovirus in insect cells is a great thing for eukaryotic cells, and in vitro transcription and translation. So each of these has an associated cost with it. So, uh, you know, baculovirus might be, if you've got infinite money, in vitro transcription, translation, and baculovirus might be the way to go. Uh, but yeast would be a, a bit cheaper. And, again, I would only try these if you, if you need to. 
uh, we go by what we need. Okay, so just as a wrap up, um, I've got my overview of what we do in my lab for crystallography, and uh, that 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 concludes my talk. So I'd like to thank the organizers, and I welcome any questions in the Q and A session that's coming up later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bruning, for a great presentation. Now, I'd like to remind our audience that you can submit your questions at any time throughout the webinar using the Q&A box on your screen. Now allow me to introduce our second presenter. Dr. Jiansheng Wu is a senior scientist in protein chemistry and structure biology at Genentech. Dr. Wu leads a group that purifies diverse proteins, including enzymes, antigens, and antibodies for small and large molecule as well as basic research projects at Genentech. The focus of his work is in the areas of oncology, immunology, infectious disease, and neurodegeneration. He also leads the protein outsourcing efforts to support most portfolio projects at Genentech. Since joining in 2006, he has supported more than 50 drug development projects. Dr. Wu received his PhD from Shanghai Institute of Biochemistry in 1996 and did his postdoctoral work at UCLA under Dr. Michael Grunstein. His research at Genentech is focused on developing innovative ways to purify proteins and antibodies in an array of different systems. Today, he will share his experiences optimizing and purifying fab fragments. Welcome, Dr. Wu. Thanks for the introduction. I also want to thank the organizer to give me the opportunity to present my work here. The title of my talk is Fast Purification Platforms. This is the outline of my talk. First, I will discuss the pros and the cons of protein G. Then, I will introduce Gamma Bind Plus as our standard fat purification platform. In the last part, I will discuss alternative purification methods for FAB. On the left side, you can see the structure of human IgG. Anybody like IgG has two light chains and two heavy chains, which are connected by disulfide bonds. FAB is the antibody fragment when the FC domain is removed. On the right side, you can see two different forms of FAB, FAB and FAB prime. FAB has a light chain and a heavy chain connected by a disulfide bond. FAB prime has a free cysteine at the C terminal as FAB. The free cysteine is usually used to conjugate to other molecules, such as proteins, peptides, and small molecules. However, when the fat prime is expressed in E. coli or two systems, the free cysteine usually form adducts with certain components of the media, such as cysteine, root cyan. Fat prime can also form fat prime 2 during expression. Therefore, fat and fat prime have different purification methods which will be discussed later. In this talk, both FAB and FAB prime are referred to as FAB. In Genentech, the expression of FAB is usually done in E. coli system with 10 ether bioreactors. The E. coli system is a fast and economic way to generate large amount of FAB. With high density fermentation, the titers are generally from 1 to 8 gram per liter. Our goal is to provide 1 to 10 gram of fab for preclinical studies. Each year, we purify about 100 to 200 different fabs. Because of the large body of work, the turnaround time and the throughput have higher priorities over other factors, such as maximum recovery. In addition, a universal purification platform is highly desirable, which should be able to handle both human and mouse fabs. 
Previously in our company, Protein G was the standard platform to purify fat. Although Protein G has low affinity against CH1 domain of fat, it binds to most human and mouse fat. This is the major advantage of Protein G, since most fats can be purified by Protein G without prior knowledge. Hundreds of fats have been purified successfully with Protein G. However, the major issue of Protein G is its low binding capacity for fat. To purify 1 to 10 grams of fat, we have to use large Protein G columns, such as 1 to 2 liter columns. We also have to load cell lysis on the Protein G column repeatedly to deplete fat. Sometimes, even with repeated loading, we still see low recovery of fat. Here is one example. In this case, we started with 800 grams of cell pellets for fat 3784. The purification process is shown on the left side. The lysate is loaded on a 1 liter protein G column. Then the column is washed extensively with several different buffers. The fat is then eluted with 0.1 molar acetic acid. After the affinity purification, we recovered around 440 mix of fat, which is less than 15% of fat in the cell lysis. We investigate where the fat goes with a protein G pull-down assay. In this assay, we mixed a small aliquot of samples collected from each purification step with protein G beads to pull down the target fat. On the right side, you can see the SDS page gel. The first lane shows the fat in the cell lysis. There are three major bands on the non-reduced gel. The 94 kD band is fat prime 2. The 48 kD band is fat. The 24 kD band is heavy chain and light chain. All three bands are our target fat. Clearly, our target protein is all over the places, such as flow through, wash 1, wash 2. Since wash 1 and wash 2 have large volume, most of fat is lost during the washing step. Since the protein G pull-down assay takes a lot of effort, we next developed a fully automated assay to evaluate the binding of fats to protein G column. In this method, we load around three mix of purified fat on a one male protein G column on ACTA. We can analyze the binding of fat to protein G column easily. In 24 hours, we can run 24 different fat samples. Most fats have similar chromatography behavior on protein G column. This chart shows a typical result. The blue curve shows the UV 280. During the loading step, most fat is captured by the column. However, during the long wash step, fat keeps leaking from the protein G column. Finally, about one mix of fat is recovered, but the rest is lost during the washing step. This is a common phenomenon of purification of fat with protein G column. This is not surprising. Protein G is usually used to purify IgG because it has high affinity binding sites on CH2, CH3 domain of FC. As for fat, protein G binds weakly to the CH1 domain. The KD is from 1 to 10 micromolar. Generally speaking, it is an undesirable KD for affinity matrix. With such high KD, the off rate of the fat from protein G column is just too high. Therefore, it is very hard to avoid the leaking of fat. We have to find a better resin to replace protein G. One immediate candidate is gamma band plus. 
also called GBP. GBP is a mutant form of protein G and has improved affinity against fat. More importantly, GBP has the same reactivity as protein G on human and mouse fat. We ran the same method with one male GBP column and overlaid the result on the top of protein G result. The red curve is the UV280 of the protein G profile. The blue curve is the UV280 of GBP profile. Look at the UV during the washing step. There is neglectable leaking of fab on GBP column. All three mix of fab is recovered from the GBP column. We tested many fabs and find that in most cases, GBP has much better recovery than protein G. Based on these results, we replaced protein G with GBP as our standard fab purification platform. This shows the workflow of the purification of fat with GBP. First, we prepare the cell lysate and load it on a large GBP column. Then we wash the column extensively with several different buffers. Triton X114 is used to remove endotoxin. Glutathione wash is added to the purification of fat prime. GSH can reduce the cysteine adducts and the fat prime too, but it does not reduce the interchain and the interchain disulfide bonds. After GBP purification, we always use SP as a secondary purification step. This is an example of large scale purification of FAB 3801 with GBP column. On this chart, you can see the loading Triton X114 wash, GSH wash, low salt wash, and acid elution. The column is regenerated with six molar quantity. In this example, lysates from 0.7 kg of cell pellet is loaded on a 1.8 liter GBP column in one shot. 4.9 gram of fab is recovered from the GPP column, which represents 79% of fat in the cell lysate. After affinity purification, we further purified the fat 3801 with SP column. We use Triton X114 again to further reduce the endotoxin. SP column can also separate fat from trace amount of fat prime too. After the two steps, around 4 grams of fab is purified. All cysteine adducts are removed. 98% of the purified fab is monomer. More importantly, endotoxin is below 0.1 EU per mg. Since we are purifying proteins from large amount of E. coli cells, this is a very decent endotoxin level. We use GVP to purify many different fats successfully. The starting materials are from 100 gram to 1.4 kg cells. The column size ranges from 300 ml to 1.8 liter. Based on the large data set, we calculate the so-called apparent binding capacity. The apparent binding capacity is used to distinguish from the dynamic binding capacity used by most vendors. On the left side, you can see that the average binding capacity is 2.6 gram per liter resin. On the right side, it shows that the average recovery rate is 67%, which is a reasonable recovery rate. We use the average binding capacity to help us choose the right sized columns. We further analyze the data. In this chart, the x axis shows the recovery rate. The y axis shows the apparent binding capacity. 
the apparent binding capacity is usually reversely correlated to the recovery rate, which makes a lot of sense. For example, if you use an oversized column, usually you will get close to 100% recovery, but apparent binding capacity is lower. On the other hand, if you overload the column with FAB, you will have higher apparent binding capacity, but you will lose a lot of FAB in the flow through. Therefore, the recovery rate is lower. Based on our experience, the desirable recovery rate is between 60 to 80 percent. In this risk, in this range, we get a good match between the capacity and the column size. On the other hand, we see several outliers at the lower left corner. In these cases, the high load does not lead to higher capacity. Our explanation is that this may be low affinity binders. We then tested our hypothesis. Here is one example. 27 gram of FAB 9975 is purified from 750 gram of cell pellets with a 1.5 liter GPP column. The apparent binding capacity is only half gram per liter resin, well below average. More importantly, only 26% of fat is recovered. When we reloaded the flow through on GPP column again, we did not recover more fat. Why is that? We load the purified FAB 9975 on one mil GPP column. During the loading step, there is nothing in the flow through demonstrating that all the fat indeed binds to the GPP column. However, during the long wash, the fab slowly leaked from the GPP column, suggesting that the protein have a very high off rate and most of fab is lost during the washing step. We have to find an alternative way to purify this particular fab. There are several candidates. Copper Select and the Lambda Select are two different resins which bind to the constant domain of the light chain. They bind to the copper light chain and the lambda light chain respectively. Capital L may bind to the variable domain of the light chain. Reportedly, it has high affinity against copper light chain with subtype 1, 3, and 4. We tested the binding of FAB 9975 to Copper Select and Capital L. Surprisingly, even though this FAB has a type 1 copper light chain, it does not bind to Capital L at all, but it binds well to Copper Select resin. Next, we use a large Copper Select column to purify FAB 9975. About 50% of the fab is recovered from the cell lysate, which is much higher than the recovery from the GBP resin. Carbon select is our backup strategy for fab, fab purification. Next, we further examine the binding of many different fabs to carbon select and capital L. In this set of experiments, we only include human fab with copper light chain subtype 1, 3, and 4, which should bind to capital L. 10 to 20 milligram of purified fat is loaded on 1 mil copper select or capital L columns. The assay measures how many mix of fat are recovered by these columns. Of the 11 human fats, all of them bind well to copper select with capacity more than 10 milligram per mil. However, only half of them bind to capital L resin with high binding affinity. The rest of them either does not bind to capital L at all or have low binding capacity.
clearly, you cannot rely on the subtype of the light chain to predict whether capital L can bind to your target set. A small-scale scouting has to be done for capital L. However, the benefit of capital L is that if it binds, it usually has high binding capacity. Next, I will show one example. In this example, we need large amount of FAB7521. If we, we use DBP, we have to load the cell license many times, which is time consuming. Therefore, we loaded the cell license from 2.8 kg cells on a 2 liter capital L column. In one shot, 19 grams of FAB is recovered. The binding capacity of the capital L, in this case, is 9.5 gram per liter, which is about four times of GBP. About 70% of FAB is recovered in a single pass, which meets our expectation. The FAB is further purified with SP color. Since capital L binds to the light chain of FAB, sometimes we saw free light chain is purified along with the fat. The free light chain is not paired with heavy chain. In most cases, the free light chain can be separated by SP or other IEX columns. In this example, free light chain does not bind to SP column and is in the flow through fraction as shown on the left side of the gel. In summary, 13 grams of fat is purified after SP purification. Carbon Select also has good binding capacity on human fat. In this example, cell lysate from one kg cell lysate were loaded on a 0.8 liter Carbon Select column. 9.4 gram of fat 7640 was recovered and the recovery rate is 70%. The binding capacity is 11.8 gram per liter. This is the summary of the FAB purification strategy. Our default platform is GBP column, which works well for most, for more than 90% of FABs. It purifies both human and mouse FAB. This is a big plus because we do not want to do small scale scouting and we can load cell license on GBP without prior knowledge. However, in some cases, we indeed see some undesirable recovery. So we have to use the alternative strategy, which is carbon select and capital L. Carbon select is used as a rescue method for FAB if the recovery by GBP is too low. Capital L and Carbon Select can also be used to purify large amount of fat, for example, more than 10 grams. Both resins have some disadvantage. For example, Carbon Select does not bind to a mouse fat. As for Capital L, the binding of Capital L to human and mouse fat is not predictable. Therefore, a small-scale scouting has to be done to evaluate its binding capacity. At the end, I want to thank many co-workers in Genentech who contribute to the development of the purification platforms. I also want to thank our CLO partners. They have done a lot of large-scale purification for us. This is the end of the talk. I'm ready to take questions from the audience. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Wu, for a very nice presentation. We'll now begin our question and answer portion of the webinar. And thank you, everyone, for sending in your questions. We've got a lot of great questions here. So the first question is for Dr. Bruning. Uh, the question here is, why use pressure over sonication? Does it actually make any difference to stability of the protein? Yeah, so there's a couple different ways to answer this question. So I was involved in structural genomics for five years 
And so with that, we got to see a lot of different cases and a lot of different proteins. And just empirically, most proteins are fine with sonication, but there were a few examples where the protein aggregated or misfolded when we sonicated, and that never we never seemed to see that with pressure. Uh, likewise, the the, the um, cell disruptors that are coming out these days are, are pretty good, and and we typically get higher yields and more solubility with them, um, it, just the way they extract the the proteins. And and why uh, it's hard to say on an atomic level why this is happening, but I, I imagine sonication is doing something, uh, disrupting the structure somehow of a certain subset of proteins that causes them to aggregate or misfold. And um, uh, one, one other key point is that when you're doing sonication, even some of these pressure ones, uh, the sample can heat up, heat, so it's, it's very important to keep them on ice and uh, to keep them cool. Okay, great. Uh, we have another question here. It's for Dr. Wu. The question here is, what concentration of TX114 do you recommend? And is this wash step temperature sensitive? It's a great question. Uh, normally, we use 0.1% Triton X114. But however, the cloudy point of Triton X114 is at room temperature, which means 0.1% Triton X114 by itself is cloudy at the room temperature. So if you want to do the Triton X114 wash, there are two options. One is do it at room temperature, but if you want to do that, you want to mix equal amount of Triton X114 and Triton X100 together, so that that will keep the Trix114 in solution. So you can wash your column with uh, Triton X114 at room temperature. And of course, if you do the Triton wash at 4 degree, then you can use 0.1% Triton X114 by itself. So no matter room temperature or 4 degree, you can, very, uh, you can remove endotoxin very effectively. Wonderful. Uh, let's see, we have another question here for Dr. Bruning. It says, I'm currently finding problems with the purification of phosphodiesterase 4A5. I've used three different tags, MBP, HIS, SUMO-HIS, and the SUMO-HIS tag, but this protein does not bind to any columns. I've also tried different pHs with no success. Do you have any tips? Yes, a few ideas here. So uh, one thing I, I didn't mention in the talk is um, typically when proteins aren't soluble, there's something, they're misfolding, there's something wrong, and that's when people are going to MBP. And so MBP is famous for making things soluble, but uh, it doesn't always make them folded correctly. So uh, when you solubilize something with MBP, it doesn't always mean that it's folded correctly. And we saw this, and again, with the structural genomics, um, it, it doesn't seem to make sense. You'd think that um, misfolded proteins would bind to his columns better, but what happens is, uh, in our, our hands at least, the uh, mis if, if a protein is soluble and expressed very well and it's flowing through a his column and it has a his tag, it's, it's, it's misfolded. So you've, you've made it soluble, but it's not folded correctly. Uh, so that, that's just one point to make. Um, so I, the obvious thing I would do is go and look at how all the other phosphodiesterases have been purified, but you've probably done that already. Um, if it's a eukaryotic protein, it sounds like you're having folding issues. Uh, so I would immediately switch to something like baculovirus or uh, Pichia uh, straight away. And um, if that doesn't work, I would uh, explore um, different truncations. So have a look at your secondary structure or any crystal structures that have been published and, and try, to, try to weed away domains or, or pieces of protein that aren't necessary or could be inhibiting the, 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 um, the ability to fold, fold correctly. And then I guess the last uh, couple ditch efforts are, you know, adding um, additives. So there is example, you know, glycerol is an obvious thing. So uh, even high concentrations of glycerol. So the, the guy that did, David Gerozalmi, did T7 polymerase. And I think to get it purified and crystallized, he had to have 50% glycerol. Sounds crazy, but, um, you know, any kind of ligands. Or uh, co-expression, expressing a protein that binds to that protein. Um, 
sounds like it's an enzyme, so it's not as likely, but if there's any small peptides or proteins you can add that bind to your protein, um, that, that often works quite well. Um, that, that, that's what I can think of right off the, the top of my head. Okay, great. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. So we, we got a lot of questions in from the presentations. We just wanted to let you know that they'll all be addressed uh, by follow-up email from our presenters. So if you had questions you sent in, we will get you an answer to those. So we'd like to thank Dr. John Bruning and Dr. Jen Sheng Wu for sharing their knowledge with us today and also give a special thank you to BioRad for sponsoring today's event. So please keep a lookout for an email containing a link to the on-demand version of this webinar. And thank you, everyone, for attending and taking the time. Have a great rest of your day.